Welcome everyone. This is Jenkins Governance Board meeting. It's the 10th of July, 2023. Thanks for being here. Topics I've got on the agenda for today include news and action items and community activity. I don't have any other topics other than those three. Are there any topics that need to be added to the agenda other than those three? Okay, then let's go ahead. So first topic was the news item. Uh, thanks to Chris Stern and Alex Brandis and others, Jenkins 2.401.2 released on time, June the 28th. The next LTS baseline will be selected two days from now, Wednesday. Uh, 2.414 looks promising, 2.413 looks good. So looking forward to that. And thanks in advance to Chris Stern for his work on 2.401.3 that will be coming up at the end of this month. Thanks to the Linux Foundation for the infrastructure upgrade. Um, Alex Brandes detected that we needed to go from JIRA 8 to JIRA 9. They completed that last week. Thanks very much to them. And I'm now a member of the CDF Technical Oversight Committee voted in. Any questions on the news items? Okay, then let's go on to action items. On the action items, I am pleased to say that after only maybe two years, okay, maybe a little less, but after an extended period, the governance meeting archives has been created and has content in it. And it's got the material from 2023. So here it is as a markdown file and visible, ready to go. So we'll continue using that. There are certainly improvements coming in the future, but it's there. I've also started the retrospective on the signing certificate renewal process. And this is a long list of historical items and mistakes at a number of points. There's still plenty to do here to think through this, to work through it, and to be ready to present it. But others are welcome to comment on this document, to to offer their insights, et cetera. There are plenty of things that went wrong in the signing, signing certificate updates and lots of ways we can improve. Two, open, two action items that have had no progress, the conversion from subprojects and SIGs to working groups. I've not done it yet. There's a lot of work hiding there. And retiring the Jenkins Chinese documentation site, the first step has been done in that the Chinese link is gone from the top level page, but the Chinese pages are still responding. And I think that still gives us the risk that Chinese users will follow installation instructions in Chinese that are simply wrong. So, so we, we want to finish that. It's going to be a while. They may still find them from search engines, for example, right? Right. And not just search engines, from bookmarks, from all sorts of places where where Chinese content is, is still there. And some of the pages are valid if they're unchanged from when the translation was done, but the install guide, for instance, is completely different. There's no, no update for system D in the Chinese install pages. So they're completely perplexed when they read the instructions there. Any other questions or concerns on the action items? I just wanted to mention a related topic um, as part of the work on um, as part of the work on upgrading HTML unit and generally modernizing plugins. I deprecated the translation assistance plugin um, because it was uh, several years since it was last updated and released, and also because the server uh, that it was transmitting. Uh, translations to has been shut down for a very long time. So, um, you know, I'm not really sure what the status of our translation infrastructure is because I know that there were some efforts to uh, some efforts to use uh, that that new service. I think it was called Crowdin, um, but I'm not I'm not sure how. Uh, if that's something that we're still using or if, if it is something that we are using, if, if it's 
documented anywhere or if it kind of works out of the box because this translation assistance plugin was very well integrated with Jenkins. I mean, you could just go to the bottom of any page and click a button and start translating things. Um, so I don't, I don't know if it's quite that simple with Crowd and if, if you if you have more steps that you need to go through and if those are documented somewhere, but um, but yeah, I think in general, I, th I think we have decent infrastructure for translation. Um, you know, in, in when we moved to Java 11, we we migrated to uh, UTF-8 for all of the, pr the properties files in Jenkins core. And, and I think that's helped a lot of people um, because they don't have to deal with uh, the encoding problems that we've had in the past. So we've made some progress there, um, but, but yeah, in general, um, in general, I think there might be some more polish that we could add to the whole translation infrastructure. Um, although I think I think Crowden is working pretty well overall. So well, that's, that's so really I, all I, I had to say. Excellent. I think Alex Alexander, if you want to comment to, I know Crowden's been documented and it's used by several plugins, but it's certainly not used by Jenkins Core. And and there's there's still plenty to do there. Any insights you want to share, Alexander? Yeah, to comment on the translation, I think translation assistance plugin is the proper name. The server for that shut down like in 2020 or something like that. But you could or still can use the plugin locally to submit translation proposals to the local instance Jenkins runs on. But you can no longer contri contribute the spec to the plugin. In case this is a valid use case for some people. But I just checked, there are like 12 or 13 plugins using, yeah, 12 plugins using Crowded at the moment, integrated with um, GitHub, if I see that correctly. So I think that builds a solid base. But yeah, you're right, Jenkins Core isn't integrated with it yet. Well, and I, I admit, I'm quite impressed with Cloudin because what it, it it is not as tightly integrated with the Jenkins experience as, as the translation assistance plugin was, but it provides translation memory and translation suggestions that at least for me as a, as a, as a poor speaker of Italian, it does a much better job for me than the translation assistance plugin did. <laughs> now I'm, I'm probably the wrong person to do Italian language translations. You can hear from my, my accent that I do not have an Italian accent. Yeah, that works basically out. It remembers what you have submitted to other plugins and other projects within Crowden and offers suggestions matching the context something is in. Also, I have to admit, I don't really know how the translation assistance plugin used to work under the hood. So my knowledge is pretty limited there. Good, thank you. Thanks very much. So yes, that is... It's a good it's a good place that we could do significant improvement in in making things more plug in use crowd in and eventually getting to the point where core might consider using crowd in anything else on the on the chinese jenkins site or crowd in related topic all right thanks basil Next topic then was community activity. And here, this is just my poor, my poor summary of how things have been happening in the community in the last two weeks. Uh, so that we had four Google Summer of Code projects that presented their midterm evaluations last Thursday. Uh, recording is available along with the slides. Uh, thanks to all four, thanks to those who mentored and are mentoring, the projects will continue. Midterm evaluations are due to Google by this Friday. And the Jenkins Project org admins have asked that we submit them to them by Wednesday, I believe it is. So making good progress. The Artifactory Bandwidth Reduction Project needs more progress. Right now, JFrog has asked us, please, it's time to lock the it's time to prepare for the the future state where the cached repositories like repo one like the eclipse jgit repository 
are private instead of public. And so we've got to do a series of evaluation changes, modifying parent palms with prototypes to switch from reading from repo.jenkinsci.org to instead read from each of the provider repositories, the JGIT repository, repo one, et cetera. Uh, they're willing to allow us to continue to use, have the cached copies, but they need to be private so that if we need to use them ourselves, we have to authenticate to, to repo in order to use them. Any questions on the bandwidth reduction project? That's one that has me worried, but we've we're making we'll be making progress over the course of the next month or two. Okay, next topic then is prototype JS. So thanks to Basel and to Tim Jacome, the 2010 prototype JS JavaScript library is being removed. Uh, it's been all references to it have been removed from Jenkins core and a feature flag has been implemented that allows a Jenkins core user to actually turn off prototype completely. Now, right now that doesn't help much because there are some key plugins that have not yet integrated and released their removal of prototype JS. And you can see the status of those in this tracking sheet Thanks very much to Basel and to, to others who are maintaining this. Basel, I think it may just be you. Whoever it is, thank you, thank you. It's a beautiful piece. Credentials and declarative pipeline are the two really big ones. And then we get down into the still big ones, but not as big. Git parameter, for instance, Basel, I think you've submitted an adoption request for that one. So that one's coming. Others further down need more and more 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 work. Any questions on prototype JS removal? Yeah, this is this is looking a lot better this week uh, than in previous weeks. And if you uh, if you go back to that list, I can I can give some updates. Um, pipeline model definition. I need to change that to yellow because it was merged over the weekend. But it still hasn't been released yet, um, similar to Blue Ocean. Um, and Git parameter, uh, I have an adoption request that should hopefully be clearing by tomorrow, I think, which will allow me to release that fix. Um, Uno choice, we've got a, a, a contribution from the community which I've already proved, and which is uh, simply awaiting a little bit more testing by the maintainer before it's merged and released. But I think we're looking very good with that one. Um, so many thanks to uh, to Rahul for contributing that fix. It was a it was a fairly difficult uh, change to implement, and I was really happy to see how this one turned out um, because we also added, uh, or I should say, Rahul also added a lot of automated front end testing prior to developing this fix. So we're in a lot better shape maintaining this plugin now and in a much more confident state to implement future refactoring and, and other changes. So yeah, Uno Choice is looking pretty good. Um, I've also got um, an adoption request for categorized view, which might take another uh, week or two uh, to clear, but that one, uh, that one should also be in good shape once I get release permissions. Um, most of the items below categorized view uh, still don't have pull requests open. Um, the Docker Hub notification plugin is maintained by some Cloud Beast internal team, and I have also pinged that team. So that one I think should be okay. Um, but the ones that I'm worried about are uh, mostly uh, corporate maintained plugins like Fortify is maintained by a corporate team, um, not, not a CloudBees one, but some other company. And similarly, um, Synopsys Coverity is another corporate maintained plugin. Same with QTest, same with OpenStack, OpenStack Cloud. Um, same with Azure App Service, same with Oracle Cloud Infrastructure Compute, um, 
same with chat work. So um, I'm not really sure uh, how we should approach these in the long term because it's almost impossible for a community member to go and test these changes. They're typically integrations with some sort of uh, third party software, you know, whether that's Fortify or uh, QTest. Um, and without access to these proprietary packages, it's almost impossible to do testing of these changes. Um, so these really need to be done by someone who uses the plugin or by the corporate teams that have developed these integrations. And so that's why I haven't submitted any pull requests to them. Um, at the same time, I have gotten very little in the way of responses to the various issues that I've filed, where I've where I've asked some of these corporate teams to take a look at uh, the use of prototype. And I think that's because we haven't set a clear uh, date by which we want to do this by. So there hasn't been uh, a huge incentive to start tackling this issue. Um, well, that's that's one of my theories anyway. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what we could do to more strongly encourage uh, these corporate teams to tackle the, the prototype removal. But I, I don't think it's something that a, a community member could implement without actually being a user of this software, unfortunately. So, so I don't know if others had any thoughts about how we could more clearly communicate that to these long tail corporate plugins. So the, the, the crucial challenge there is this is not, the prototype change is not the kind of change where you make the change and don't interactively test it. It's critical that we interactively test every one of these changes and make sure that that code is executed correctly. Yeah. Okay. And so, so therefore, yeah, these, these integration things, you've really got to have the other side of it, right? It's, it's, I see your point. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, development wise, uh, or as the kind of problem, it's similar to tables to diffs, no? Um, so I don't remember exactly how we went about there, but, uh, I think we set a date that at this point tables to this will be merged. Your plugin will needs to be adapted. We will file the issues for you. We'll we'll take care of the most popular plugins. And after that, it was up to the maintainers. Um, I mean, with these many plugins and the um, problems, and actually, you know, not being able to test um, any potential changes that we might be able to submit. This is the basically the only way to go about doing that. Yeah, no, I, I know, I know that it's inevitable to some degree. I'm just trying to minimize that amount of, you know, collateral breakage to the, to the degree that it's possible. But I think the, the biggest action item I can come up with is that it would be good to get some agreement on when we want to do this. Um, mm -hmm. We don't have to decide it right this the second, but if people could start thinking about what timelines would make sense, I think that would go a long way. As Daniel just alluded to, um, you know, once once we have a better timeline, then that would be a strong motivating factor to address these issues. Um, and I, I don't think that this could be done for the next LTS release. It would be something that we could only consider for the the LTS following the next one uh, at the earliest, but um, yes, yeah, so right we'll... because we're choosing the next baseline day after so... tomorrow, so it's a right. little late for that. Right, um, of course. Well, but but it is feasible to choose the, to to try to fit this into the next twelve week cycle, so that we could have this have that that boundary date actually on the next on the LTS after. You know, the one that will be 16 or so weeks from now. Yeah. Or or the one after that. I mean, I'm not in a hurry to to do this, but um what whatever whatever we decide on, um this is something that we should communicate very clearly. So so we, we have a little more flexibility than with tables to divs, if I remember correctly, there um 
we decided to basically merge the change immediately after the LTS cutoff. So to have the most weekly releases before we cut the next LTS baseline uh, to take care of regressions, this change looks extremely safe and well understood and it's in core already um as an optional flag so i don't think that problem applies there so at any point in the next three months should be fine in my opinion yeah i mean i, I also am aware of some proprietary plugins that need to be adapted that are not on this list because they're not open source but um that's that's why my my gut feeling is that the next 12 weeks would be fairly aggressive mm. and it might need to be you know the next 24 weeks that we're looking at rather than the next 12 weeks to be to make sure that everyone's really on board um well next 12 weeks means um it will be in lts within 18 weeks right yeah also something to consider yeah well, i think this ultimately comes down to who wants to be driving this effort to remove it from core. And I haven't have been taking that role myself because Tim has the draft pull request to switch off the flag. So I wanted to make sure that others are involved in the conversation. Um, but yeah, it seems, it seems like the sooner we can agree on when we want to do this, the better. And I, I don't want to make that decision myself. I think that makes sense. So it feels like it may be a there. I mean, there are still there are still items very high on the list that say it would be a really bad thing if we if we merge that into Jenkins Core, right? With credentials and declarative pipeline, it, it weekly would be would be terribly disrupted if we merged too soon there. But having the discussion in the developers list, at least to say, okay, should we? Should we look forward and try for a merge within 16 weeks? And and then that conversation about, okay, what would that mean in terms of timeline and which which LTS version would it go into, et cetera? Good, good point. I, I think that it'd be okay if I started that conversation, Basil. Do you you do you have any objections if I start that conversation to try to ask about that just to get people? thinking about it I, I think I think you may be right that 12 weeks may just be too aggressive given given the number of things that need to be done particularly not just proprietary plugins from my employer from Cloudbees but also proprietary plugins from other other large companies right from synopsis and yeah. from from others it's it's in in everybody's best interest that this be a smooth rollout and we'd like it to be much smoother than tables to divs was yeah yeah I mean if you're interested in having that starting that conversation that's fine with me um i i don't mind starting it either but i was uh just i was just waiting until more of these rows had turned green but yeah i think we, i think it's an important discussion to have great all right thanks anything else on prototype js removal I was wondering about um, the feature flag. How has um, your experience with that been? Are we aware of users who enable it and just try it? Or, you know, is there, is there non-developer use of this? Do we know that? There's at least one because we had one bug report in community.jenkins or one report in community.jenkins.io. Hey, I turned off prototype JS and things fell over badly. And they fell over badly because because some very high on the list things haven't yet removed their use of prototype JS. So we know there's at least one usage of that feature flag out in the community. Now I don't know beyond that. And Daniel, it's a you're more familiar with it than I am. Is there usage data reported centrally on feature flag enable disable? I suspect there isn't. Um, I haven't seen anything, but it could be added pretty uh, pretty easily. 
Ah, yeah, okay. So when we were doing Java support, etc., basically this information was added uh, on demand because uh, we have analytics engine. Well, thanks a lot to Daniel and all <laughs> the contributors. But uh, the data itself is being injected uh, the uh, on demand. Uh, what was mentioning that um, I've been actually working uh, with uh, open feature and open telemetry community. And I many times I mentioned Jenkins as one of potential adopters uh, for feature uh, open feature engine once it really becomes uh, vendor neutral. So maybe we could integrate it to get some statistics on feature flags uh, in mm -hmm. a more generic way. But it's well, it's definitely well outside this particular uh, thing. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Any other discussion around prototype JS? Uh, so uh, the question is, uh, what uh, quality bar? What uh, is the quality bar for releasing kit in weekly? So, Basil, I think you can probably best describe it there. Um, my sense was that Basil's expect. Well, I'll be quiet, Basil. I'd rather have you say it in your words than me say it in mine. <laughs> Sure. Uh, I feel very strongly that anything with more than uh, a thousand installations, with, with with very few exceptions, should be green on this spreadsheet. And uh, so, I, I, from my personal quality bar, is that there needs to be a, a fairly strong justification for anything that has more than a thousand installations to be not green. Um, and, and there are some of these exceptions, like the translation assistance plugin, which I deprecated. Um, and th there may be other exceptions to that. And But uh, even, even the things that are below 1,000, I still try to look at them on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and some of them are truly uh, abandoned, like you know, HTML audio notifier is, I think it's like nine years since the last release of it. So, I feel pretty safe to, about ignoring that. I can't imagine anyone still using these audio notifications uh, 10 years after this plugin was last released. But that isn't the case necessarily for some of these others, like uh, OpenStack Cloud or um, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure Compute. You know, I don't know how many people are really using these. And some of them weren't released that long ago, uh, maybe like two years ago or something. So even for these, I want to treat them on a case by case basis rather than simply assuming that anything less than a thousand is safe to ignore i'd want to i want to try to make the best effort to either repair these ourselves or to contact the maintainers um, like i said earlier some of the challenges in repairing these ourselves is that they really are integrations with third party software that are extremely difficult for us to test mm -hmm. so i mean otherwise i would have already Submit, submitted a pull request for it. Mm. So I guess uh, offering detached plugin could still be a kind of plan B. Because for me, the concern would be not this plugins per se, but uh, all the custom plugins uh, everywhere we cannot really control. And uh, we know for a fact that the uh, majority of them will be eventually tested when uh, this instance is upgraded to LTS. <laughs> so. I wonder whether we could just uh, approach like with previous removals, ship uh, a plugin uh, that is immediately deprecated and at least have a plan B and at the same time uh, have more freedom of releasing the thing uh, once the quality bar is matched. There is no configuration attached to this. Unlike, you know, uh, matrix job, external monitor job, JUnit plugin, they all had user data attached to them. So I think it's a different situation. Yeah, so in this case, we put a detached plugin. So basically the plugin that is not bundled by default, not installed by default. Well, then it's not detached. Uh, then it's just a separate plugin like the one I wrote okay. for. Okay, yeah, uh, sorry. Um, uh, it's uh, my terminology mistake. But yeah, what right. I meant is actually if someone experiences issues and definitely we are not going to fix uh, 
all the plugins uh, in the wild. Um, so maybe just providing it as a simple plugin uh, could save us a lot of time on uh, firefighting later. Yeah, I'm, I'm of two minds about that because on the one hand, it would give people an escape hatch. We, have, we do have a project-wide history of providing these escape hatches. So certainly consistent with our past uh, our past experiences, but on the other hand, I really don't like shipping these escape hatches because you never you never know when it's safe to rip them out, and if you really remove it fully without having an escape hatch, you'll get feedback very quickly if it's if something stops working. Whereas if you have the escape hatch, someone might be using it and not telling you about it. And then you never really know when it's safe to remove the feet, the, the old code. It, it, it effectively commits the development team to supporting the old code indefinitely, which is, which is some, which is not a non non-zero cost that I'd that I'd rather try to avoid. So I have some mixed feelings about providing an escape hatch. There, there are pros and cons. Something else that I find interesting in particular with this project is how few plugins are even affected, right? So we have like 2000 plugins total and you found just 65 that actually needed to be changed, meaning the chance that a plugin is all else being, you know, being equal that a plugin is affected is fairly small. So um, there's a good chance that we're basically talking about zero plugins. Amen. Yeah, most, most plugins are doing extensive JavaScript on the front end. Probably the most sophisticated one that I've seen was the Uno Choice Active Choices plugin, which I didn't really know about. But this plugin does some very sophisticated reactive JavaScript to to add and remove parameters on the front end based on selections. So that was very interesting to me because I didn't know that we had stuff like that out there in the ecosystem. But um, most, most of our front end is extremely, either extremely simple or implemented up with something other than prototype. You know, For example, all of Dr. Hoffner's plugins are using non-prototype modern frameworks to do sophisticated things. So the, the, the intersection between the set of doing fancy front end and doing that with prototype is indeed very small. Very good. Thank you. Any, anything else that we need to discuss with regard to prototype? Feels like the next stop is a discussion in the Jenkins developer list about getting a rough timing on, on when. And I think Basil's right that it's probably not in the next 12 week cycle, but 12 weeks after that may be a very, very good time um, given the, the progress we see so far. Great, all right, thank you. Next topic was HTML unit three. So whereas prototype JS is an upgrade of production code, HTML three, three, unit three is test code, but it's widely used and quite important to how Jenkins does its testing. And so the, and the upgrade from two to three was a breaking change. Uh, so it's, there are now hundreds of pull requests open and those pull requests are making progress through the system. So I've not seen anything that indicates this is going badly, just that there's there are an awful lot of things that have to change in order to do it. Any comments from others guiding on how's HTML unit three going for you? Okay, well, and the tracking sheet, again, a great help to have these tracking sheets on these large scale migrations. And this one, okay, Chinese localization plugin is the first one that's read. 
and then okay yeah so this looks looks quite promising yeah and this spreadsheet most of the work is in the you know 20,000 to 1,000 range um and that's that's always the most difficult part of any of these ecosystem wide projects um in the sense that there's there's a lot of plugins that are within that range where they aren't big enough to be actively maintained but they are still widely used enough that we need to be be somewhat concerned about them um so there's yeah there's that's probably the the area that that needs the most attention in here is that that range that we're looking at now of i don't know 20,000 to 5,000 or or something like that right and again, these are these are test changes, but they are potential barriers for other changes. If one of these plugins needs to update its parent palm, then it will have to do the HTML unit three upgrade in order to, to get the new parent palm. Yeah, very good. Thanks. Those are all the topics that I had. Were there any other topics that others wanted to bring to governance meeting today? All right. Thanks, everyone. The recording will be available in roughly 24 hours. Thanks very much for your time. Yeah, just quick congrats to Mark uh, for being collected to the CDFTOC. I'm not sure whether you mentioned it in the beginning, but yeah, congrats. Thank you. Thanks very much.